Today's video is quite the interesting one. Today we are talking about the gorgeous beauty Yvonne De Carlo. She had this reputation in Hollywood as being easy to sleep with, with many of her lovers claiming that everyone at one point has had their share of Yvonne. Many famous men wrote of their encounters with her in their own memoirs, and she even dated a few princes and shahs. Most people would think that De Carlo would feel some type of way with this reputation, but no, not one bit. In her later life, she wrote in her own memoir about her many one night stands, listing the A-list celebs she wooed. She stated that she loved men. She was young and gorgeous and was just living her best life. But of course she suffered her share of heartbreaks because of this. She went through a lot and I have sympathy for her story. And once you peel back the onion and all the layers, you too will understand DiCarlo and see that she lived the best way she knew how. Today we will peel back the onion and do a deep dive on her childhood career, her many loves, and accomplishments. We will first start with understanding her personality a little bit. What was her beauty secrets? Because I mean, she was stunning. I fell in love with her from watching the Ten Commandments as a child every Sabbath. I was obsessed with this movie and thought her character Sephora, who is Moses' wife in the movie, was absolutely gorgeous. Though dressed simply, she exuded confidence, strength, and realness. As an adult, I saw her in Salome and was mesmerized by her dance moves and the ease that she graced the silver screen with. So of course, with my curiosity, I will gladly get into her beauty routine, fitness, diet, and other little known facts about her before we get into the heaviness of her childhood and life. But first, Hey friend, welcome to my channel, Karina Lude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn on your notifications so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's hop right in. Let's start with her beauty secrets and let's start with her diet. Standing at five foot four, the same height as me, DiCarlo had the figure of a siren. You would think in her youth that she was on some strict regimen, but DiCarlo actually ate pretty normally. She stated to Lydia Lane, and I quote, I don't go in for these hurry op diets that make you so starved, you eat the weight right back on again. I believe in doing a little every day. You feel so much better for it. If you crave something like fried potatoes, have one. Yvonne does not believe that beauty is worth too much self-denial. Life loses its zest when there is too much discipline, she said. I feel sorry for women who force themselves to diet rigorously. They are unhappy doing it, and the unhappiness is reflected in their faces. Dieting is fine if you can enjoy it and can find a diet that contains foods you like. In Iran, they serve a dish of steamed rice with raw egg yolk and spices mixed in. I liked it so much, it's become one of my favorite dinners. I don't know the calorie count, but I'm sure it's below that of an average dinner. I think the secret of successful dieting is finding a diet that contains foods you like. You might say, but all the things I like are fattening. That is hardly ever true. If you look at a list of low calorie foods, I'm sure you'll find that many of them are things you are fond of. If you could make up a diet consisting of these things, I'm sure dieting would be no hardship at all, Yvonne suggested. I think with a little thought, we can enjoy everything we have to do." End quote. When it comes to fashion, she told Lydia Lane, I love to follow fashion or be ahead of it, but I avoid what is not attractive on me, such as little white collars or extremely tailored suits. When I shop, I always have an eye to fit. I have watched studio people fit my clothes and I have seen how tricks of alteration make an inexpensive dress look expensive. I have been designing some of my own clothes for this is one way to assure individuality. I think it would be a good investment if women had at least one dress custom fitted, if only to see the difference and learn how it's done, she said. When it comes to hair, she told Lydia Lane, I have a difficult time with my hair. It is very fine and very straight. It is a problem when I have a perm, so most of the time we use a curling iron to get the soft effect that I want. I don't like hairstyles that are too set, but I do like them neat. When it comes to skincare, she said, there's nothing that takes the kinks out of me like a hot bath. I love to put pent oil in my water before going to bed and stay there until I am limp. I think this is one reason that I have never had to take sleeping pills, Yvonne concluded. I think everyone who works in pictures, who has makeup on her face week after week from the time they get up until they go to bed is faced with the problem of retaining a good skin. So much depends on getting your pores thoroughly clean. After I have removed my makeup with oil, I always go over my face 
base with a rough washcloth and then I like the friction of drying with a bath towel. When it comes to hobbies, she loved to travel. There is no actress in Hollywood who has been to more foreign countries than Yvonne DiCarlo. She stated to Lydia Lane, I love to travel, but traveling has taught me so many things. It is very helpful to get out of your own country. When I first started in pictures, I had so many things on my mind. I was working so hard to become a good actress that I neglected my appearance. My aunt used to give importance to these things. She used to scold me when my lipstick wore off or I wasn't as neat as I should be, but I didn't heed her words. And when I went to England, the people were disappointed I wasn't more glamorous. I remember they wrote, she was rather pretty in her low heel and comfortable suit, Yvonne laughed. You know how they described me the next time I went there? Bejeweled, bedazzling, and beautiful. It takes discipline, technique, and effort to look your best, but the difference it makes is tremendous. When she's working on a picture, she insists on doing her own makeup. I feel I know my face better than anyone else. I know the method I use is against all rules and regulations, but it turns out well. There is a general interest in American cosmetics and you can find them almost everywhere you travel, she went on. But few of the women abroad know how to use our rouge correctly. They miss the important points, such as picking the shade that is right off their coloring. For example, Yvonne uses a dry rouge with a roussette tinge. I apply it with a wet sponge, she confided. The sponge allows you to blend in the color delicately so there is no visible line. Another of my makeup tricks is powdering my lashes first so that my eyeshadow won't collect those tiny lines around the eyes. The base of powder also acts as an undercoating to make the lashes appear slicker when the mascara is applied. When it comes to her religion, she was raised as an Anglican in her autobiography that Carla wrote about her faith in God, stating, God has saved me and mine from some pretty sticky situations. For me, religion is a little like being a Republican or a Democrat. It's not the party that counts, it's the men. Therefore, I care not what house of worship I enter, be it Catholic, Presbyterian, or Baptist. I elected God a long time ago and I'll stick with him because I don't think his term will ever be up." End quote. She is a conservative and she stated in a 1976 television interview with the CBC saying, I'm all for men and I think they ought to stay up there and be the bosses and have women wait on them hand and foot and put their slippers on and hand them the pipe and serve seven course meals. As long as they open the door, support the women, provide <laughs> and do their duty in the bedroom, etc." End quote. Her favorite things to do was ride horses. She was very good with horses and loved playing in westerns. Her favorite color was black, so leave a black heart in the comments for her. She also loved to dance and was a phenomenal dancer. She began her career dancing, actually. She also loved to sing and even recording an album. She was really into the arts and was very cultured. We already talked about her love of travel. She stated that the best way to learn about a culture is to immerse yourself in it, to eat the food of the locals, and not to be afraid to wander off where the locals hang out. Even when she became became super famous, she would never shy away from getting the full experience in another country when she traveled. Now, as far as her childhood, Yvonne de Carlo was born Margaret Yvonne Middleton, and she entered the world on September 1st, 1922 at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Her mother, Marie de Carlo, was a French-born woman with a Sicilian father and a Scottish mother. Peggy's father was William Shelton Middleton, a salesman from New Zealand. Sadly, Peggy's parents didn't have the happy ending that fairy tales are made of. By the time Peggy was three, Williams abandoned the family, leaving no trace behind. Yvonne had only two memories of her father, climbing up to his knees and crawling towards his feet. By the time Yvonne was three, her father was involved in various swindles and fled Canada aboard a schooner, promising to send for his wife and child. Marie and Yvonne never heard from him again. Rumors said that he remarried twice and had more children, worked as an actor in silent films, or died aboard a ship. Yvonne later wrote saying, My own assumption is that he died before he had the chance to discover that his baby Peggy had become a Hollywood actress, or I think he would have tried to contact me. End quote. Marie, her mother, was left alone to care for Yvonne, and they struggled a lot. They lived in several rented apartments in Vancouver, including one without furniture or a stove, and it got very cold during winters. Yvonne would, however, occasionally return to her grandparents' home, where they held religious services in their parlor. Despite Marie's difficult circumstances, she was determined to make sure Yvonne had every opportunity to succeed. Yvonne was enrolled in the June Roper School of Dance when she was 10 and joined the choir of St. Paul's Anglican Church to strengthen her voice. Marie was the driving force behind Yvonne's interest into entertainment and made sure she had singing and dancing lessons. Her mother was determined to make her daughter famous and pursued it relentlessly. 
Writing was Yvonne's first love. She won a poetry contest when she was just seven years old with a poem titled, A Little Boy. Her prize was $5, which meant a lot to her at the time. Yvonne adopted plays to perform in her grandparents' house and even adopted Charles Dickens, a Christmas carol for a neighborhood performance. She wanted to be a big author and playwright. Yvonne was a student at Lord Roberts Elementary School located a block from her grandparents' house. While Yvonne's family members were religious and attended church regularly, they had nothing but praise for her talent and ambition. And although the family often experienced poverty and difficult living conditions, Yvonne's creativity and drive kept her spirits high. She was undoubtedly a strong and spirited child who was determined for greatness. Now as far as her career, Yvonne De Carlo was a Canadian-American actress, singer, and dancer who made a name for herself in Hollywood during its golden era. Her journey to become a successful actor was not a smooth one, as she and her mother made several trips to Los Angeles in search of work. In 1940, she won second place in the Miss Venice Beauty Contest and placed fifth in that year's Miss California competition, which led her to meet the owner of this famous nightclub called the Florentine Gardens, Nils Granlund. DiCarlo's talent and charm impressed the audience, and Granlund gave her a job as a dancer at the Florentine Gardens. However, her dream was temporarily shattered when she was arrested and deported back to Canada by immigration officials. In January 1941, Granlin sent a telegram to immigration officials pledging his sponsorship of DiCarlo in the U.S. and affirmed his offer of steady employment, enabling her to re-enter the country. DiCarlo wanted to act. She tried out for a role but was asked to take off her top and her mother refused. She hired a talent agent and got the first uncredited role as a bathing beauty in the Columbia Pictures B film Harvard, Here I Come. Her work in the film helped her gain entry into the Screen Actors Guild and during World War II, DiCarlo and other Florentine dancers entered troops at USO shows. She also appeared in rodeos. Universal offered DiCarlo a longtime contract after screen testing her for an exotic glamour girl role. She starred in Salome where she dance which was a box office success. The studio had undergone a nationwide search for the perfect girl to play the part of Salome, claiming they considered more than 20,000 girls. The chosen actress had to be beautiful as well as talented in song and dance. When DiCarlo was chosen, she was dubbed the most beautiful girl in the world by American film producer Walter Winger. She was an unstoppable force. This isn't as glamorous as we think. Unfortunately, Yvonne found herself giving in the old Hollywood casting couch because in the end, in that era, it was extremely difficult to make it any other way and she grew desperate. The ravishing and ravenous Yvonne DiCarlo was at the height of her beauty when Robert Wagner spotted her in her car alongside his at a drive-in restaurant called Jack's at the beach. She nodded for him to come on over, which he quickly did, and she invited him back to her place for sex. After three steamy lovemaking days at her home, he returned to find his car still parked where he had left it. A week later, he ran into Tony Curtis, a good friend of his, who described in detail how he too had met Miss DiCarlo at the same place that very week and had accepted her invitation to accompany her home for similar steamy intimate sessions. Everyone in town has had Yvonne DiCarlo, he wrote in his memoirs, but it was true, she liked men. And according to these men, she would scope these fancy restaurants and already have her target in place, knowing who was the wealthiest and able to help her career there. Then she would try her luck and luckily for her, Wagner took the bait and shot her into stardom. DiCarlo starred in several Technicolor productions and British comedies, but she was tired of being typecasted as the exotic woman. She ventured into film noir and serious dramatic performances with Brute Force and Criss Cross. DiCarlo won a Laurel Award for her performance in the Ten Commandments and was also voted the Queen of Technicolor three years in a row by cameraman. Even though she received praise for her performance, she refused to be nominated for Best Supporting Actress and instead wanted to be listed as a leading actress on the voting ballot. DiCarlo starred in over 80 films in her career, including Flame of the Islands, Band of Angels, and The Sword and the Cross, in which she portrayed Mary Magdalene. However, she is best remembered for her role as Lily Monster in the CBS sitcom The Monsters, which ran from 1964 to 1966. She reprised her role in the feature film Monster Go Home and the television film The Monster Revenge. In 1951, DiCarlo became the first American film star to visit Israel and received warm reception and capacity audiences for her concerts. She also entertained the troops during World War II, further showcasing her commitment to her craft. Yvonne DiCarlo wasn't just an actress and dancer. She also had a beautiful singing voice and she shared it with the world when she decided to record an album, Yvonne DiCarlo Sings, was released in 1957 and consisted of 10 tracks. And some of the songs included are Blue Moon, End of a Love Affair, and A Little Girl Blue. Throughout her career, DiCarlo won several awards and recognition for her performances, including a Laurel Award and a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. She published her 
best-selling autobiography, Yvonne, in 1987. Yvonne DiCarlo's extensive career is a testament to her talent, versatility, and determination to succeed in the industry. Now, when it comes to her marriages, DiCarlo is not so lucky in love. She blamed her absent father for her distorted view on men in love. And when she did find love, oftentimes the men just wouldn't commit. She was engaged a few times, but it was to men who had the appearance of gentlemen, but were drunks and cheaters, so she called the engagements off. In her memoir, Yvonne happily named the many famous men who visited her bed. Quite a few were serious relationships that she hoped might evolve into true love, even marriage, but there were an awful lot of one night stands too. Somewhere along the way, she found time for several seemingly serious involvements. Among her many sexual encounters were the following, the Shah of Persia, Rod Cameron, Walter Matthew, Errol Flynn, Red Skelton, Anthony Quinn, Billy Wilder, and Burt Lancaster. According to her autobiography, she and Burt made love on a mink coat in her backyard. Like many, many of her encounters, it was a one-off thing. Already, Yvonne was acquiring a reputation for being easy. She was also more than willing to make headlines. Any publicity was good publicity, she felt. That kept her name before the cinema going public. Affairs with band leaders Artie Shaw and Howard Hughes were common knowledge. Howard Hughes refused to make their relationship public and refused her push for him to propose. Howard, though, had a similar reputation in Hollywood and slept with all the starlets. It's a wonder there was no word of him being sick from this. He was worse than JFK, in my opinion. While Prince Abdul Reza Pahlavi of Iran was visiting Hollywood, he met and became infatuated with the Carlo. Soon enough, he was sweeping her off her feet, even taking her to his royal palace in Tehran. It was just a fling, but look how close our girl came to being a queen, right? Yvonne de Carlo's marriage to, to stuntman Robert Drew, Bob Morgan, was both tumultuous and tragic. The couple first met on the set of Shotgun in 1955, but DiCarlo, being the respectful person she was, did not pursue a romantic relationship with Morgan, who was already married with a child. However, fate had plans for them, and they ended up meeting again on the set of the Ten Commandments in Egypt. This time around, they were both free to explore their attraction to one another, and they eventually got married on November 21st, 1955, at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Reno, Nevada. DiCarlo took on the role of stepmother to Morgan's daughter, Barry Lee, and the couple had two sons together. Unfortunately, their marriage faced a huge challenge when Morgan was seriously injured and almost died while performing a stunt in the film How the West Won in 1962. The accident left Morgan permanently disabled and both he and DiCarlo filed a 1.4 million lawsuit against MGM, claiming that the studio was responsible for Morgan's injuries. DiCarlo had to work tirelessly to support her family, often touring with stage productions or performing in nightclubs, and the strain of Morgan's constant arguments took a toll on their marriage. He was depressed that he couldn't work and salty that she was still thriving and now the complete breadwinner. It became all too much for her, and in 1968, DiCarlo even considered divorcing Morgan, but she ultimately decided to work things out. However, when she returned home after a New Zealand tour of No No Nanette, she filed for divorce on the grounds of irreconcilable differences. Their divorce was finalized in July 1973, and while the reason for their marriage's failure was complicated, it's clear that the incident and its aftermath were significant factors. DiCarlo was a strong woman who did everything in her power to keep her family afloat, but even she couldn't heal the emotional wounds caused by the tragedy they faced. And after this marriage was done, she gave up on men and was like, the only man for her would be Albert Einstein. But she thought that the rich actor types, they were airheads and weren't too intelligent and couldn't contend with her. Now, as far as her death, DiCarlo suffered a minor stroke in 1998. She later became a resident of the motion picture and television country house and hospital in Woodland Hills, where she spent her last years. She died from heart failure on January 8, 2007 and was cremated. All in all, I think the extreme poverty and absence of her father reflected in the choices she made in her dating life. People underestimate just how badly women are affected from the absence of their fathers. Who knows what her mom had to do to get them by? DiCarlo was a hard worker and she grind and grind and did the best she could to get this far. In an era where women was not respected and in an industry where it was normalized for women to be used and discarded, I'm not making excuses for her, but wow, don't the stories all seem to be the same? It's easy to speak boldly as we lay, lay in comfort in this outspoken generation where women can now vote and work and expose creepy men without being, you know, blacklisted. But back then in the golden age, even the most glamorous and wealthiest of women were still at the mercy of men. May she rest in peace. Leave a black heart in the comments for her. Comment who else would you guys like to be added on the list. And if you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Support my brother. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time. Thank you.